A venture-driven architecture has common patterns and practices that are solutions to various problems. The issue arises when you don't have these problems or you do have them, but maybe you shouldn't. Here are some common patterns and when they might be anti-patterns. The first common pattern is to use events as a form of data distribution. To illustrate this, let's say we have two different services and we've established kind of in the industry that we don't wanna leak internal implementation details or internals about a service. That means that we have service B here we can't go access directly service A's database and understand its structure, how it stores its data and all those internals. Rather, we'd have some API that service A exposes. So we don't wanna do this. We don't wanna access data directly from another service. But it's pretty easy to leak internal information even using an event-driven architecture. But before I explain how, let me thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS and event-driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So if you're using the pattern of using events as data distribution, you need to start thinking about, are you leaking internals? And you really wanna be thinking about, do I have inside events or outside events? Inside events that are within my service boundary or outside events I need exposed to other services because you need to be aware if you're leaking internals. So there's different forms of thinking of these events. They can be kind of coarse or more granular. They could be data centric, kind of driven around CRUD or behavior centric really derive kind of business events. So the thing is, is when you start thinking about how you're doing data distribution, it often could kind of lead into the mode of thinking about CRUD by entity, which is more coarse, or kind of CRUD by property, which is more granular. So you can think about if you have an entity or some type of document or table within your system and that changes, what type of events are you publishing? Are you publishing a customer changed event or a customer address changed event, or the customer city changed event. These are all generally CRUD centric, data centric. So when you're being data centric and thinking about events as data distribution, that's when things like CDC, change data capture become popular, is that you're recording these changes from your database, you're publishing these to some topic, event stream, whatever the case may be, and then you have other services consuming these events so that they can update their own local copy of that cache or their own data but you're using these events or things like CDC as a form of data distribution. So when does this pattern become an anti-pattern? It's really in two forms for me, is that if you end up leaking internal information, because this information really isn't explicit if you want to be, if that's what you're intending, to be on what actually happened. You have these data change events, but why did the data change? If you're trying to infer that, then that's when you really wanna be explicit about the business events that are occurring, not these data change events. Secondly, are you using that data for reporting purposes or to denormalize data, to aggregate data from various sources? That may be a valid use case, but be aware that if you're using something like CDC or ENCODE to do this, that you may be leaking internal implementation details. Now it's really a contract that if you wanna start changing those underlying pinnings of how you structure that data, that you need to keep that as the same because now it's a contract for other consumers. So be aware of leaking internals and be aware of whether you want to, you're want you really being implicit when you may want to be explicit about the event. Another common pattern is trying to shove and turn everything into an event when it's really not. There's really kind of two forms of messages that we have, which are commands and events. Events are something happened. We want to indicate specifically something happened. Something's occurred in the past. They're generally owned by the publisher. So who's publishing an event? We have a service boundary. We wanna tell other services or ourselves something happened. So the, the event is owned by who's publishing it. There may be zero or many consumers. Maybe nobody cares about that event. Maybe there's hundreds of consumers that care about that event. And the only that service boundary that owns that event, it's the one that's gonna be publishing it. That's the only place that's gonna be published in that event. And as mentioned with naming, it's in the past tense. Not everything's an event though. You do have things that are commands where you want to invoke behavior. You want to request something to happen. It hasn't happened yet. You're requesting it to happen. So you want to invoke behavior. It's generally owned by the consumer who's actually consuming the event. That's who's actually owning that contract of what that command is. There's only one consumer for that command. There's only one thing that's going to actually process, handle that command. But there can be many different senders preferably within that same logical boundary. And generally it's a verb because you want to invoke something. Don't force events. If you, I understand if you have the infrastructure, you have various tooling, 
to handle pub sub, to handle events, but not everything is an event. But things can get a little gray and a little dicey because if you think of a request, okay, that can be a command, but something like requested, well, that's an event. But the point being, just don't force the issue of an event where it really doesn't fit. Another common situation is wanting to process messages in order and using partition, partition keys, etc., cetera, to, as a solution to this. So let's say we have two different partitions. Our producer is publishing one to the top partition. We'll call that partition A. And then we have, say, another partition, partition B, the bottom one. And then we have different consumers in our consumer group responsible for consuming just the, these partitions. So only one partition will have one consumer. So our top partition, partition A, now has two messages. And let's say these start getting processed by our consumers. So the top one is handling that top partition. The bottom one is handling partition B. After partition um, A, that first one, is consumed, that message is consumed, then our consumer after that can consume that secondary message. Ultimately, we're processing messages in order. A common scenario why people want to process messages in order is related to the very first thing I talked about, which is data distribution. Because if you have more granular events, uh, for example, something property or something was modified in your system, well, how do you know that you're actually getting the latest? You'd want to process these all these kind of change log events in order. Because what happens if you have a created event, then immediately a modified event, and you don't process them in order, when you have some type of entity changed event, but you actually haven't processed the created event, you're kind of going to be in an issue there. So that's why sometimes why people want to process messages in order. But I go back to the question, is that a problem that you should have because you're using this as a form of data distribution? Second to that is often there's business processes where you need you think you need to process them in order, but rather I'll have a video at the very end of this video talking about workflows and state and process managers, sagas, these types of things that you allows you to have messages come in out of order, but then be able to process the entire workflow when you need to. Another common practice is trying to treat events as that they have a response. This kind of relates to the first one is also kind of confusing them with commands. This actually does happen with queries as well, is trying to use asynchronous messaging when really you just want the synchronous call. It's okay to have that temporal coupling. It's fine. You want to request data, get the data back immediately rather than, again, trying to force events into the mix. I've seen this a lot with messages and queues, but it also has been happening with events where you have one service sending a particular message. You have that consumer of whatever that event is kind of treating it as a command really, but then providing a response via another event or some type of request reply asynchronously that then gets back to the original requester that it consumes that event, that reply. It works, I get it. It's asynchronous still, you're decoupled, temporally at least. But oftentimes you don't need to go through this regular role. Yes, event architecture is great, but sometimes you just have that temporal coupling, it's fine. Make a request, make that request response, RPC, whatever it is that you need to get data. It's just a query. A lot of these patterns have utility. The problem arises and where they kind of become anti-patterns is that you're using them kind of in a square peg round hole situation here where you have the hammer so everything becomes the nail. It's just understanding the context of when they're useful. Using events as data distribution for CDC within your local boundary, sure. You're, you have to compose data for reporting, sure. Trying to infer them because they're you're trying to get something explicit out of it, not so much. Linking internals, not so much. Using order processing, decreasing throughput because of it, when you really don't need order processing, can become an anti-pattern. There's just all these things that you can, they have utility. It's just a matter of really understanding the context and if you really do have that problem. The kind of the analogy that I often like to use is you're traveling, you're walking from point A to point B and you're walking through the mud all the time. So your answer to that is, well, I need better shoes or I need boots. Maybe if you look to your right, there's a sidewalk that's not muddy and you know, don't need boots at all. So it's just really kind of looking at the landscape, looking at your context. Not everything is a pattern. Not everything is an anti-pattern. It depends on your context. And if you really do have that problem, or if you actually don't need to have that problem at all, and so therefore you don't need the pattern as a solution. I actually have a bunch more of these event-driven architecture patterns, anti-patterns, and kind of context. So if you've been enjoying this video, let me know in the comments and I'll create another video kind of explaining more of these. If you found this video helpful, or you just want to talk to other people about kind of these patterns, what you're doing, 
you have questions, or you want to provide guidance to others, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you did find this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment, and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.